nervous as you can imagine for the last uh, three weeks since I was asked to do this. Uh, I tried to make a list. I'll probably go way off topic. Um, I am Chris Larrabee. I grew up in the Knox Jackson area. Uh, I lived in Jackson, but I hung out mostly in Knox. Uh, uh, people don't take offense, but I am 21 years old. I'm just a pop. So okay, give me a chance at this. I'm nervous. Uh, I'm just going to talk tonight about uh, the addiction that I had, uh, all the drugs that I used, what it caused to in my life, and how God literally ripped me out of the chains that I was in with the drug addiction. And uh, when I was young, I think I was 10 years old, my uh, parents separated. Um, and for you parents that are out there and have kids, uh, that is one thing that a child never forgets. Uh, not to make my parents feel bad, but I remember the exact day that they separated and moved out. I remember every word, and I always will. Um, it is very hard on a young child. Um, it's just hard because, especially in my situation, I started to learn how to manipulate. Uh, Dad, Mom, let me do this. Mom, Dad, let me do this. And uh, I got my way, I can tell you. And then you bring grandparents into it, and it gets really worse. <laughs> uh, uh, I just got to, you know, if there are parents out there that have separated just pray to god if it's in his will to reconcile your relationship not only for uh the parents case of it but the child's it is uh it's very hard i like i've said um another thing in my list here i got a before christ uh section here uh uh brooke my lovely wife that i have now i've known her for as long as i can remember um, I remember when we were just young, uh, our grandfathers were very, very close, uh, did horse pulling together, did ox pulling together, and uh, I don't know, it was probably eight years ago, we were at a horse pulling event, and I tied a piece of construction tape around her finger and said, someday I'm going to marry you. Well, uh, I don't know, I think it was two years after that I started dabbling with pills. Uh, I was bullied really bad in school. Um, I was on ADHD medicine, and we'll come to find out that ADHD medicine can you be used in other ways to uh, not make a kid just docile, but make him one very on edge, as I used to call myself a gorilla. Um, I was I started snorting my uh, ADHD medicine at I think 13, almost 14 years old. Um, my mother started noticing my prescriptions were going missing. I said, Ah, oh, mom, they you know fell in the sink. They uh, the dog ate them or something, just stupid excuses. And that's when my manipulation started really bad. And with doing these kind of pills, I uh, started uh, getting really bad anger, punching holes in wall, uh, punching stuff at school, getting in fights. I don't know how many fights I got into in school, but I did win some and I did lose a lot. So <laughs> they didn't help very well, but it didn't bother because the, the more I lost, the more I got upset, the more drugs I did. Um, my anger got really bad uh, and uh, started taking out on my family members, telling, telling my family members I hated them and just really rude, awful stuff like that. Um, the next section in this uh, list is my grandfather. Uh, he just passed away in March 26. Uh, I gotta say, like, before I truly found Christ, my grandfather was my God. I, uh, I looked up to him. I tried to do everything just the way he did. I, uh, he was a very good man, and it, it got to the point to where he had to start telling me to stop coming around. Uh, I was stealing from him. There was uh, one weekend I was really hurting for drugs, and uh, I went to his house where my grandmother also lives. I walked inside and uh, broke into their safe, and I stole $1,500 in cash, and uh, I left. I went and got really high uh, and just started running around being stupid with the money. And uh, this was my first, uh, I should say, conviction from God. Uh, I think it was within a week I went back over to their house and told them what happened. And uh, that was the hardest thing I ever did. I've never cried that hard in my life. And I'll always remember their faces. And uh, so that all happened. My grandfather got diagnosed with uh, cirrhosis of the liver. I think at one time they gave him six months to live and the old boy lived almost three years. He really fought and uh, 
So they had a big benefit dinner for him, but before that, I uh, still had money left over. Um, I decided uh, it was a good night to uh, go get a bunch of alcohol, go get a bunch of cocaine, and uh, I was riding around Brooks with one of my friends, well, I thought was friends, and I said, geez, it's a good idea to do 100 miles an hour through this little tiny town. Well, uh, I'm here to tell you, you don't do 100 miles an hour through Brooks because we went over the four-way. Uh, I had a video on my old phone, which I smashed with the hammer when I got saved. I said, there's no more of that. Uh, we hit the intersection at 100 and I think 12 miles an hour. We went airborne for a long ways. We were in a tiny little car. And this right here, folks, was my first true uh, experience with God. At the time, I just thought it was uh, someone up there. I, uh, we hit a telephone pole. We totaled a one-ton truck. And both me and the driver of the car walked away from it. I, I ran away from it, but I don't know what he did. I wanted to get out of Dodge. Um, I walked up to my buddy's house, and I said, I need a ride back to my truck. He says, uh, his mom actually came out. She was like, you need to call your mother. I said, that's not happening. And uh, she's like, well, go in the bathroom and clean yourself up. I just thought I had a bloody nose. That was not the case. My face was mangled. My nose was broken. Um, my neck was all messed up. And I looked at myself in the mirror and started crying. And I said, ah, you need to call my mother. So she picked me up at my buddy's house. And we're going down the interstate in my truck because her truck was being... A typical Chevy. I'm just kidding. I love Chevy. <laughs> We're going down the interstate in my uh, my favorite truck I've ever had, and it it starts like slowing down, going faster, slowing down, and I'm like, Jesus, Mom, I've done a lot of work to this. What is wrong? And I happen to open my eye long enough, and she had my old '90s style Chevy doing 100 miles an hour down the road. I says, Mom, I've crashed once tonight. Let's not do it again. So uh, we went to the. Uh, emergency room i started freaking out you know they tried to sew my face back up and uh they got ready to write me a prescription of painkillers and i thought i was like yeah we're gonna we're gonna make out good here well my blood test came back and that changed everything she was like uh the nurse came in i remember she was like are you sure you want us to read your blood test in front of your mother i said well she pretty well knows what's going on um another big thing in my life that I actually found out after I got saved, went to the Arise program, was towards the end of my drug run. I'm not sure who exactly, but I know three quarters, at least three quarters of my family had restraining orders on me. I couldn't access their property. I couldn't go near them. And I don't blame them. I wasn't even me. I, I couldn't even call myself me. And uh, one thing that does haunt me a lot is... Uh, my grandparents were in Florida. Um, my dad at the time, he was drinking pretty heavily. I was doing heroin, coke, anything you can imagine I could get my hands on, I was doing it. And uh, we got in a big fight and he told me I need to go back to my mother's house. And uh, well, we got in a fist fight, cops got called. Uh, <clears throat> and my grandmother was texting me and I told her I wish I was dead. I wish my family was dead. I just wish everybody was dead. And uh, I didn't want to be on this earth no longer because I was a disappointment to everybody. And uh, leading beyond that, uh, well, before that, I should say, my grandfather broke up many fights between me and my dad. But praise God, he got, he got sobered up. He stopped drinking because nothing worse than addiction but a father and son both in addiction trying to have a relationship. It just it doesn't work. I can, trust me. And... Uh, so that happened. I told my grandmother, I just said, uh, I, want, I want to be dead. I want to get out of here. And uh, I think it was two or three nights later, I was passed out. Crazy, huh? Uh, on the couch at my mother's house. And I woke up to my mother and my sister sitting there giving me the stare. I says, uh-oh. I says, they know. And they are like, uh, Chris, you know, we know what's going on. You know, we know what you're, we, they didn't know what I was using. They knew I was using so I, uh, I right there, like I'd been kind of talking to myself. I didn't know I was praying at the time, but praying now that I know, like God make something happen, like shut me down. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, said, Chris, you either need to, you know, get some help or move out. And my first instinct was, well, I'm moving out. So uh, I 
drug addict in the middle of winter time with no job trying to find an apartment, uh, impossible. So uh, I told them, I said, I think, it's a, I think it's a good idea to get some help. So uh, my brother Damon at the time, he uh, was in a, a, what I thought was a you know Christian program. Oh, that's crazy. I don't need none of that stuff. And he was in an addiction program in Machias. And I loved, I still do love my brother right to the moon and back. We did a lot of running together. And uh, I think it was Christmas Eve. I was sitting at the uh, Christmas Eve of 2008. I was 18. I was sitting at Hilltop Store in Knox. And I was an awful paranoid drug addict. Like, I wouldn't go into public unless it was dark out. It was the middle of the day. And I'm sitting there on the phone with a guy trying to find something. Like, I'm obviously hurting. And Damon is home on a visit from Machias. And uh, he comes and knocks on my window, and I am in awe. Like, when he first left for this program, he was maybe 90 pounds soaking wet. Um, te- just looked terrible, and he was fat. I was like, what happened to you, dude? <laughs> and uh, I rolled my window down. And I said, how are you? And he said, I'm doing very good. I says, well, how do you feel? Because that's something we always ask each other. How are you feeling today? Do you need something? He says, I feel like a million bucks. And that was the end of the conversation. And for me, I know that was my divine appointment at Hilltop Store with Damon. And God was very much on the scene because when I left there, uh, you know, people always say you've got a devil on one shoulder and the angel on one, and my angel grew big very fast. And I started hearing the voices. And I remember when I talked to my mom and sister about going to a rehab, I said, oh, we're going to take our time. I think it was three days later I told them, well, we are leaving tomorrow to go to a detox. So I went to a detox down in Portland. Um, I was there for six days, but when I first checked in, I think I was there 45 minutes, and I called them. I said, this ain't for me. Uh, You need to turn around and come get me. And they made every excuse. Ah, we can't hear. (laughs) We're breaking out. (laughs) You know what I mean? And uh, so I stayed there, and it started getting hard. And uh, that's where I learned uh, anxiety is one of the biggest. I I know it's a, it's a, uh, it is a health problem for a lot of people, but I know the devil uses it at times. I was having anxiety about drugs i need to get a fix i need to get this i need to get that and i kept telling myself i called the director down to machias and i said uh i don't know what you can do for me but i need something he's like let's pray together so we started praying and uh the six days ended that i was in the detox and my mother picked me up and uh brought me to Machias and when we went by the exit going from portland to Machias, the exit to my home I told them, I says, you either need to pull over or I'm jumping out. And, well, they didn't slow down, and I didn't have the guts to jump out the window at 70 miles an hour. So we went to Governor's in uh, Ellsworth, and that's where I met Paul Trovarello. And uh, for you guys who do know Paul Trovarello, when I talked to him on the phone, I thought he was this big, bad, you know, Italian guy. And when I walked into Governor's, some of you guys know, he stands like five feet, two inches tall with spiky hair. I see my brother Damon there, and I'm like, where's this Paul guy? He's like, he's right here. I was like, hey, guy. And uh, so we sat down to eat, and I'm not, obviously I wasn't very familiar with the Christian way of eating. And uh, I sat down and started grubbing out. Damon's like, dude, you don't do that. I was like, I don't? I'm like, I'm, I like my food. I'm six days clean from drugs, and I was hungry. So uh, we got eating there and praying and talking about my past. And this lady from across the room comes up to me and says, supper is on me today. And I was like, oh, oh that's a coincidence. And the director of the program said, no, that's God. And the amount that she gave me was, was the exact amount, almost to the cent of what I needed to pay for my dinner that day. And I was like, wow, maybe this God guy is real. (laughs) So uh, we left there, took the uh, hour journey to Machias. And uh, I walked into the Arise house, and there was 11 other guys there. I says, this is going to be different. I lived with my mother and my sister my whole life. Like, I was, you know, used to watching horse shows and (laughs) makeup shows and stuff like that, you know? I walk in, there's a football game on. I said, oh, this might not be too bad. 
So uh, I sat, I stayed there a couple days and I was like, I need out of here. And uh, I had a meeting with my pastor, uh, Aaron Dudley, and the director of the program, Paul. And we sat down in the back of the church. I said, listen, uh, I pretty much got this under control. Like, you don't know who I am. And I was telling him how I could run this equipment, run that equipment. And I don't know if it's very biblical, but they both laughed at me. And I was like, come on, guys. I'm like, you don't know who I am. And uh, from there, my anxiety just started really killing me. And then I started using an excuse, well, I need to go home to provide for my mother. And the director of the program was like, trust me, bud, you weren't providing for your mother at all. And I said, well, I shoveled the roof. He was like, well, if it's in God's will, there won't be no more snow. <laughs> and come to find out, all went along. One of my old friends that was, uh, that I know of, still actively using, would just show up to my mother's house while I was gone and shovel the roof, not ask for money, not ask for nothing. And uh, so I met this guy named Paul Maxey, this little four foot two guy from Texas. Uh, very good guy, very, very in love with the Lord. And uh, he comes up to me and is like, listen, dude. He was like, if you stay here 30 days and still wanna leave, he says, I'll give you a ride anywhere. And I says, really? I says, 30 days, that ain't bad. He's like, just make your mother, you know, do what your mother paid for. She paid my down payment to get in the program. I said, 30 days ain't nothing. So we prayed together and I never forget it. Them 30 days were up and that just shows how much faith he had in God that I would surrender for him. Because when them 30 days were up, he asked me, do you want to ride? I said, absolutely not. Um, to back up just a little bit, I, uh, I talked to the director of the program into letting me go to a doctor. Uh, I need anxiety pills. I need anxiety pills. So uh, I went to a doctor down in Lubeck, very easternmost town of the United States. And uh, I got a big two prescriptions of big pills, like big horse tranquilizers to help with anxiety. And I went back that night and I got ready to open that bottle to start taking them like correctly in the program. The director says, uh, before you do that, I want to pray one more time. I says, that ain't going to help, dude. And... Uh, we all gathered together in a big group and uh, we prayed and uh, I don't know whatever happened after I left but the day I graduated both of them pill bottles were still in that office still sealed and still shut and I'm pretty sure they're still there and that was my first time I said wow like I need to know this God guy because he just took my anxiety away like that it was overnight I woke up the next morning a new person, and which is what a Christian does. He wakes up every morning and dies to self daily. And uh, so time went through the program there, and I started just going with the flow. I remember having this Bible I had. It was the King James Version, thee, thou, thus, like words that I was like, what is this word, dude? And... Uh, my brother Damon, his uh, now wife, Sarah, brings me a Bible that's the NLT version. I says, uh, well, what's the difference? She's like, well, this is for people that can't understand them words. I said, well, that's me. <laughs> so I started reading it, and it's a simplified version. And I mean, I started in Genesis. Like, I know a lot of people don't start in Genesis to get saved. But just them first 15 verses, I'll always remember them. I says, oh, really? God created light. Well, where'd... Oh, there's the darkness part of it right there. And it just, every question I had got answered right in them first 15 verses of Genesis. And uh, so I just kept reading the Bible and I started believing, but I didn't really get saved. I says, well, I know you're up there, but I really need you to speak to me. And uh, Easter service came around, resurrection service down in Machias. And it was a very good time. Like I was getting goosebumps the whole, the whole service. And when you get goosebumps in the church service, that, <laughs> you know that message was very good. And at the end of it, I'm a very shy person. Like, I'm sitting up here still shaking at the knees. Luckily, you can't see my knees. And uh, they did an altar call at the end of it to dedicate your life to God. And uh, uh, my brother Damon and his family were sitting next to me, my mother, and my sister, I think. And uh, I would take one step. No, I can't do it. I'd take another step. And Damon, he's literally righteously, let me tell you, punching me in the back of the head, like, go up there. You need to dedicate yourself. And I finally did it, and I come back, and everybody's crying. I'm like, what's everybody crying about? I'm like, this is cool. <laughs> so uh, 
that went on uh i did the altar call there and i mean everybody then knew that i fell in love with jesus and uh then the time came along to have my first visit with my family and uh well, everybody called me fat when they first saw me, too. My dad, my mom, they're like, whoa, you got big. I said, we need to go shopping, because I, I went in with medium clothes on, and by the time April rolled around, I was in there four months. I was in extra large clothes. And uh, we went to governors where my mother, my father, my grandmother, and my grandfather, and my sister came to have dinner. And uh, it was enough work to get my mother and father in the same room at this time. And... Uh, they sat there and were troopers through it all, and I'll never remember, I'll never forget it. And the first thing I wanted to do was apologize to my grandfather when he got there. And he came up to me and said, uh, Chris, I forgive you. I said, you do? I says, for everything I did? He says, for everything you did. And uh, from then on, I, I knew that I had to stick it out in this program. I had to learn who Jesus really was. And... Uh, so I had my first visit home, which was uh, perfectly right on my birthday. And I went to my cousin Jen and Derek's house, and everybody's looking at me funny, like, who is that guy? And I'm not kidding when people didn't recognize me. Like, my family was like, is that Chris? What happened to him? And I mean, I had a big beard, big belly. I mean, I was eating well in the program. And uh, <clears throat> that's when I found out my cousin Josh and Ivy we were, they got saved. They found out who God really was. And uh, they kind of have a similar background to me and Brooke. They partied, they drank. And uh, man, when they came up to me and said the word Jesus, I was like, whoa, that's a weird word to come out of you guys' mouth. And uh, just to sit there and talk to them about what God has done <clears throat> in my life and everybody else's life, it was truly amazing. Like it was just to be able to share the gospel with people is one thing, but to share Share it with your family is a whole nother, I should say, uplifting. It was amazing. And I was very close with my cousins, Jen and Derek. They were my second parents. Anytime I got my four-wheeler stuck, I always went and got Derek. I said, dude, I need some help. I can't go wake Dad up on this one. And uh, I remember the day I chopped one of my fingers off. My cousin Derek never used to like blood. Like, he see a little speck of blood on that table right there. He looked just like a big pine tree, tip right over flat. <laughs> And he was right there the whole time helping stitch me up. And uh, it just the bondage that I used to have in my family before drugs and then wild drugs. I honestly forgot how all my cousin's kids looked like when I was doing drugs. I'd see them like, who are you? And come to find out they were my little cousins, which is very sad. And uh, before all this, I actually forgot to mention, I did get arrested down by Hannaford's right here in Belfast for trafficking. And uh, that happened in 2000, the beginning of 2017. And the judge kept putting it off, putting it off. Putting, I said, dude, just get this done and over with. When I started, I think they wanted a year in jail and a year of probation after. I said, that ain't happening. And uh, my grandparents hired me a lawyer, which I don't, I still to this day don't know why they did it after everything I stole off them. And the judge put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off. And when I was in the program, I had to go down for a, uh, <laughs> a court hearing. And anyways, the judge was asking me, and I told him, I said, I'm in a uh, Christian discipleship program down in Machai. He said, good for you. How long have you been clean? I says, uh, seven months. He says, you've been on bail for over a year. I says, yeah. And that judge stared at me, and I says, yeah, he's going to send me to jail. And that judge looked at me and said, son, I very much appreciate your honesty. He's like, I want you to step out of the courtroom. And when I came back into the courtroom, I got the deal of a lifetime. He says, if you do another year of probation and 15 days in jail, he says, everything will get dropped down to misdemeanors. <clears throat> I've been a hunter my whole life. And I says, I'll take it. And uh, when I went home and told all my family, they're like, 15 days in jail. He says, it's either that or a life of being a felon which i didn't want and i know god had his hand on that the whole time because i haven't seen a court case get put off i think i went to court over this six times and the judge just said oh we'll put a hold on this until next month next month so uh that whole weekend i got blessed i bought a truck while i was in the program i came home for four days and uh i slipped up and smoked some cigarettes which was not allowed in this program 
So I went back, I uh, admitted what I did wrong, and they took my truck that I just bought, and they took my phone, they took all my abilities away for two weeks, and I was mad. I said, I'm just gonna take my truck I just got, I'm gonna go home. And then I realized God wouldn't want me to do that. He'd want me to face my consequences. So I did, and uh, that weekend, I got asked to be in my brother Damon's wedding. And I says, uh, I can do it. And I said that I would do it, I would be his best man on Friday. And I got sentenced to this jail time uh, the same week of his wedding. And I says, oh, this is not going to end well. And uh, God really spoke to the director of the program. And uh, he let me graduate a week early, which is very unknown for the Arise program. I got to do my time, which I recognize quite a few of you guys from the reentry center. And I'm very, very blessed to see that a lot of you guys got baptized a couple weeks ago. That just... Absolutely. When I see that on Facebook, my wife wasn't there, but I have never jumped that high in my life. It's just amazing to see guys that are uh, just like I was, just hardened criminals, being prideful, which I still am to this day. God's still working on it. To get baptized and surrender their life to God is truly amazing. And uh, see, I just lost my spot. but um, So everything got dropped to misdemeanors. Um, but just before this, I started talking to my wife I have now, Brooke. And uh, while I was in this program, I was saved. I was this holy roller that I thought I was. And uh, I started calling her every week, and she would not stop partying. I said, girl, if you want to be together, you got to stop partying. I kept calling her, kept calling her every week, faithfully, every Sunday at about 3.30, right before I went to church. And... Uh, one time I called her and I could tell over the phone she had been smoking pot. So I was like, you know what? I says, we can't talk anymore. So I hung out. I went out into that Arise house and I was mad. I mean, madder than a wet hornet. I said, she doesn't want to be with me. All she wants to do is party. I think a couple months went by and the director of the program said, uh, Chris, we need to talk. I said, what's that? She's like, this Brooke girl uh, just wrote you a real big letter. I says, oh, really? So I read it, we got talking again, and uh, God opened the door for her to move into my mother's house, and by then my mother knew what partying was all about. She knew the ins, she knew the outs, and she knew, she knew all the excuses. So I said, that's good accountability for you. So she moved in there, and uh, this concert came up in July, I believe it was, of last year. It's called Rock the Flock. It's very, very good event if any of you guys want to go sometime. Um, that's where Brooke truly uh, dedicated her life to Christ that night. Uh, I wasn't there. I was at Dunkin' Donuts. But uh, she did. She dedicated her life to God that night. And uh, I was the most proud boyfriend at the time. And uh, so I kept going through the program telling her, oh, we're really getting married now. You're saved. I'm saved. We got the okay from the director. We are going through with this thing. So... Uh, we kept going on, uh, ups and downs, you know, living two hours away from each other. It was definitely a, definitely a struggle. And uh, so I graduated the program September 30th of 2018. And uh, just before that, I was trying to move home. Like I had a job lined up. I had everything lined up. And I'm telling you right now, when I say God closed all doors, he slammed them dead in my face. Like he would not let me move home. And uh, which is good because uh, this area has definitely not gotten better. And I know truly if I would have moved back here without no accountability, I'd be using again. And uh, I was doing some groundwork there for the construction company at this guy named Troy Parsons house. I was like, geez, this guy's got tattoos head to toe. He's got a bald head half the time. And uh, I had heard that he takes guys in from the Arise program. I says, uh, what's this thing I hear you take guys in from the Arise program? Meanwhile, this is, I think, four days before I left the program. He says, yeah, I could probably do that, but I leave for elk hunting tomorrow. I said, that's fine. I got to go do a missions trip. He says, where are you going? I said, jail. <laughs> he says, oh. He's like, well, that's a good place to go. So uh, I got out of jail. I think I did two weeks, something like that. I got blessed. I got out early. And uh, so I packed all my stuff and I got ready to move, truly move away two hours away from home. And uh, I got there and he's still elk hunting. And it was just me and his wife at the house. And 
I am a very shy person. Like, I didn't talk to her for a week. She knew I was downstairs, but I didn't talk to her. And uh, it came to nine months I lived with them. I just moved out a month ago into the apartment that me and my wife got blessed with. In them nine months, they literally adopted me by Christ. I still obviously have my biological parents, but I spent every minute I could with these two. They both hunt, they both like guns. Um, they both like trucks. Like I was just like, this is awesome. And uh, I actually told my wife, I said, if I weren't getting married, I'd probably never move out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and they're truly the best people that I met in Machai. They are just down to earth. They're very open hearted. Like they, <laughs> they let some drug addict they knew for 36 hours move into their home. And it came to, uh, when I moved out, their dog actually really wanted to go with me and not stay there. And uh, so me and Brooke, we got blessed with an apartment. We all, by the way, we did get married, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole nother talk. That could, that could take hours to talk about, but I gotta say it was one, one wedding that I have seen that went off without a hitch and it was a very wonderful time and I'm very blessed. Uh, we got blessed with an apartment down in Jonesboro. Uh, meanwhile, I grew up on my grandparents' farm, which is hundreds of acres, big barn. And this apartment I got blessed with is about the size of the kitchen over there. Very humbling. And I know God put me there for a reason. And uh, we have recently just bought a new dog. Uh, just God has been working through our lives. We've actually been really praying hard, and we could have uh, used prayer. We're getting ready to... Uh, start the process of buying a house. Uh, we found a house that it just, we can't keep our eyes off it. We can't even drive by without pulling in the driveway, whether people are there or not and walking around and basically claimed it. <laughs> and uh, they don't know it yet, but it's ours. So uh, we're working on that right now. We both got very wonderful jobs. We make good money. Um, I work construction right now for a big construction company down in Machias. I run equipment. In the days I don't run equipment, I work on the equipment. Uh, that is one thing God's truly blessed me and both of my cousins with. We, we can make some excavators and bulldozers do some funny stuff. And uh, it really, truly, it came from God, but our grandfather really held our hands. I think all of us, before we were even out of diapers, was running equipment with him. And uh, it's just... The stuff that God has done in my life, I couldn't even, I can't even explain it. There's so much stuff on this list I wrote here I didn't even talk about. But uh, I just want to thank my family for all the support they've given me. Even when I was in the midst of my addiction, they kept saying, Chris, do better, but you need to leave. Which I could understand that. And uh, I remember my last Christmas, before I got saved and went to the program, I used to spend hours Christmas Day, and I think I went to everybody's house on Christmas Day that year for like 20 minutes, long enough to get my cards full of money, and I left. And it just, now, when me and my wife go to family's house, she's gotta be like, Chris, let's go, we gotta go, we have other places to be. I just love it, and uh, I praise God for all the work he has done in the communities around here, and all the work he's done in me. Um, I just wanna uh, point out a couple before I close point out a couple of scriptures here in this holy bible that uh really spoke to me throughout the uh program the one that really spoke to me was proverbs twenty one sixteen, which is uh, a man who wanders away from the uh oh geez now i gotta look at it but it's a man who wanders away from the uh assembly of the smart or something like that i forget now a man who wanders from the way of the understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Uh, that verse spoke to me every single day I was in that program. And it took me a while to understand it. Uh, I do have some learning, writing, reading disabilities, and God has really, really worked on them. I used to be able to look at a verse out of a Bible and take 10 minutes to read it, read it, and now I can read it pretty fast, praise God. And... Uh, Another good verse that really spoke to me throughout the program was, uh, I believe it's Matthew 26, 41, and it's watch and pray that you won't fall into temptation. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is definitely weak. Um, just to touch on something that's been going on in our, my life lately, um, 
I don't know, a couple months ago, uh, I just started getting prideful. Stopped, uh, started to go to church, not four times a week, but three times. And then the next week it went down to two times. And uh, I never noticed the difference, but I started taking my anger out of my wife, yelling at her. I thought she was my little maid. Do the dishes, do this. And uh, well, she, she straightened me out real quick. Let me tell you, she's got a, I don't know if any of you guys know Whitcombs, but they got a real wild side. <laughs> and uh, it just really showed me, we, we did struggle there for a little while. And uh, she looked at me and said, you need to go to church. I says, uh, you are true. I went, <laughs> I started going back to church uh, three times a week, going to studies at the Arise House daily, and uh, I'm actually being the godly husband that I'm supposed to be. But the second you start falling out of God's word, man, you back backslide faster than you can even imagine. I've seen it. Um, since I was in the Arise program in January of 2018, I buried five of my very close friends from that program. Uh, I don't even want to say names because I'll probably lose it and start crying, but uh, these are all guys that either graduated the program or left the program early and simply stopped going to church, stopped being in God's Word, and stopped praying. We had one guy leave the program, said this wasn't for him, and he drove 12 hours home to New Jersey from Machias and died within the first 12 hours that he was home. And uh, I remember getting a call and losing it. This was a very blessed and uh, very good kid. kid. Uh, his name was Andrew. That man could draw anything you could ask him to draw faster than you could go take a pee and come back. Like, he was just blessed with drawing. He was an artist. Uh, I will talk about another one, Sean Murphy. He was from the Bangor area. Um, he went to a party. Right in Machias, actually. Uh, he started going home to Bangor every weekend, and uh, he overdosed and died in one of his brothers in Christ's bathroom. Um, they were both kind of strayed away from the Lord at the time, but uh, he overdosed and died in his bathroom. And when I got told the next morning, I had never been so heartbroken to know because I just gave him a hug the, that night before and said, I hope to see you at church tomorrow. And I never saw him again. But I know uh, he professed with his mouth that he believed in Jesus Christ, and I know he's up there glorifying God right now. Um, <clears throat> I just want to, you know, thank God and pray for all you guys out there. If you guys have prayer requests, ask somebody. That is one of my biggest struggles is going to counsel to talk to people because my pride starts flaring up. And pride can get you in a backslide and actually a relapse faster then a lot of things can. Um, I also want to talk real quick before I close about accountability. Um, I never knew what that word meant until it got truly shown to me. Uh, down in Machias, we have an accountability circle, I should say, down there that would blow your mind. Um, since I was out of the program, you know, I smoked a couple of cigarettes here and there. And every single time I went to go to the store to buy some, somebody from my church would walk into that store like, what are you doing, bud? <laughs> Anytime anybody from that church uh, starts backsliding and going places they shouldn't, they, people hold them accountable. And uh, that is one thing. You can be very strong in faith. You can be very strong physically. But accountability, I believe, truly is a lot of your walk with the Lord in to stay sober. Uh, you can't do it all alone. Um, so I guess that's almost just about everything I got. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ken for asking me to do this. Uh, I've been praying that it would happen, but also praying that it wouldn't happen because I'm very nervous. I still am, even though I'm about ready to be done. And uh, Ken came up to me at the Cure Conference in Bangor this year and said, uh, have you shared your testimony yet? I says, nope. He says, do you want to? I says, I guess so. And I think I went home that night and started writing stuff down. And that was uh, quite a while ago. And uh, just praying, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to talk about? And uh, to be honest, I wish everybody could see the list that I wrote about. I don't think I talked about 15 things on this 100-page list that I wrote. It just, the I know the Holy Spirit talked straight through me tonight. And I hope that there is somebody out there that this message did uh, 
did touch and got a little fire started in you because that's all it took for me was that little fire from God started deep down inside of me and I think it's truly become to a, a, a true disciple of Christ. Uh, so that's pretty much all I got. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, I will real quick pray in closing. Uh, Father, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to this crowd, Lord, in the town that I used to run and gun in. And uh, Lord, I thank you for this crowd. I thank you for the food, Lord. I, I just pray that you bless the hands that prepared all of it, Lord. Uh, I pray if there's anybody in this crowd tonight that is wondering, uh, who's this God guy? Who, how does this all work? Uh, I pray that you speak to them. Give them the wisdom of what to do and who to go to, Lord. Um, I pray everybody's safe travels as they return home. Um, Lord, I just pray you keep working in the Belfast community, Lord. It really needs it. And uh, the new and upcoming Arise program in Belfast, Lord, I pray that you bless it to no end, Lord. Uh, I know you sure have blessed the program in Machias, Lord. Uh, I pray you bless this one and just... Make it open arms, Lord. Invite anybody in, Lord. Make your will be known to everybody. Uh, Lord, I thank you again for this night and pray everybody makes it home safely. And I pray that you uh, really start uh, fires in people's hearts tonight. Open their hearts up, soften them, and make them start asking questions. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I am hot. So I'm being told that if you guys like the Arise page, then